Hi, and welcome to the CIPD Central London and North London event, how to build a financial wellbeing strategy for your organisation. Um, my name is Garen Rauch and I'm absolutely delighted to uh, facilitate tonight's event. Um, we've got two really experienced and knowledgeable guests. Uh, we've got Lee Dunkley from Schroeder's Personal Wealth um, and we've also got Lee, uh, Luke Kite uh, from Redico. So as we said, um, it's a short, sharp session and we've got two brilliant guests for you tonight. Um, the first guest is Lee Dunkley and she's the financial wellbeing lead for Schroeder's Personal Wealth. Um, she's going to be talking for around about 15 minutes or so. Um, and at the end of her, what we'd like to be doing is thinking of questions for Lee, um, and then we'll have five minutes of Q&A. Um, then, then switch to Luke, um, who's head of culture at Redico, uh, and then welcoming your questions for uh, Luke as well. Schroeder's Personal Wealth is actually one of the UK's leading wealth management organisations. Um, and Lee's role there is actually partnering with organisations of all different sizes um, to support their employees at different stages in their financial planning journey. And that's everything from education to guidance to advice. And as you'd expect for an um, established organisation um, such as Schroeder's, at uh, least got all of the qualifications you would expect her to have. Um, then we've got Luke. Uh, so Luke is head of culture from Redico. Um, Redico is an innovative design agency. Um, they basically really put people, are taking a people first approach to developing their employees. Um, and from an OD practitioner perspective like mine, um, some of the work they've been doing is fascinating and he'll be sharing some of those things. Um, but what we specifically asked him to do today um, is to talk about his experience of implementing a financial wellbeing um, strategy. And all of the things that they've done has actually been recognised externally by them being very the fourth best place to work in the UK in 2020. So, of course, you know, of all the different subjects that we covered to cover in relation to well-being, why have we focused on financial well-being? Well, the case for financial well-being is quite overwhelming. Um, and recent research by CIPD um, has found the following thing. So 32% of Londoners um, say money distractions have caused work issues for them. Um, and that financial well-being doesn't just impact low-income employees. What the CIPD found is that people with higher levels of education attainment um, are just as likely, if not more likely, to report that money has affected their job performance. Um, and there's a lot of impacts that come from um, financial well-being. So th the top five that the research finds are um, lost sleep, worrying about money, um, difficulty concentrating and making decisions due to money worries, um, spending time during work dealing with money issues, um, the health problems that are caused from carrying the stress of financial worries. Um, and the fifth one is taking off time to deal with financial problems. So you know, there's a real both uh, a compelling productivity perspective, but also a mental health perspective as well. Wow, great. So over to Lee. Um, Lee, if you'd just like to share your screen, if that's okay, um, and then we'll put the spotlight on you. Fantastic. Hopefully you can all see that now. Great. Yep. So over to you, Lee, and, and off you go. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you, Gary. And welcome, everybody. So as Gary said, my name is Lee Dunkley, and I'm the Financial Wellbeing Lead at Schroeder's Personal Wealth. And um, so Schroeder's Personal Wealth is a financial planning, financial advice firm at its heart. But our real core strategy is to fundamentally make financial advice more accessible to more people across the UK, um, and in turn, really improve financial wellbeing across the nation. And we do that in a number of ways. But one of the key ways that I work and it is a real passion of mine is to take financial education guidance and more importantly advice into the workplace and work with organizations of all sizes to really build that strong and compelling financial well-being strategy that's going to truly engage employees and really give them tangible things tangible takeaways to help them to go away and start to build that financial plan that's ultimately going to help them and support their journey. Before I get into those kind of practical tips and tricks to help you guys, I want to just take a step back and really start off with what is financial well-being? Because sometimes the words of well-being and particularly financial well-being is something that is, is banded around and is a bit of a buzzword. And actually, we really wanted to delve into what that means. Um, and when we start to ask people, you know, what does financial well-being mean to you? One of the first things that often get, we get a response is actually more money. I want to get a promotion. I want to earn more. I want to have more money in my bank account. And yes, while that's great, absolutely having more money means that you've got more at your disposal to buy nicer things and you know have more experiences, spend money on loved ones, which will increase happiness. Actually, it's not about that at all in, in its finest form. Actually, what financial well-being is about is about having an understanding of your finances, having you know that financial plan, which means that you're in control, you feel confident, and actually you can start to prioritize what is important to you, which is really, really key. 
Um, so why is that important? And I guess more importantly for you guys, you know, why is it important in the workplace? So at Shredder's Personal Wealth, we've done a lot of research in this area and we actually launched our inaugural Money and Mind report just last year. Um, and the findings of that were, were quite astonishing. Um, so the first one I kind of wanted to pull out was the 48%. So 48% of UK adults feel regularly or occasionally stressed due to their financial situation. So if we think about that, that's one in two. One in two people are actually having concerns and worries about their financial situation kind of on a regular basis. Um, And actually that word stress keeps coming up time and time again, which just shows how intrinsically linked financial well-being is to mental health and actually when we're thinking about our well-being strategy you know in in its round we need to be conscious of this and we need to make sure that it's supporting people in the right way the three percent I really wanted to call out as well because whilst one in two people are saying they're worried about their finances actually only three percent of employees have ever shared these worries with their employer now to me that's a little bit crazy because your place of work is where you accrue a lot of your wealth it's where you get your salaries it's where you might get any bonuses or commissions it's where you um, build up your workplace pension it's where you get other valuable benefits such as protection policies So why when we get to a time in our lives where we're maybe feeling a little bit bit stressed or concerned about our finances, would our employer not be the first person we turn to? And I think there's a couple of reasons behind that. And, And number one is because finances are a complete taboo. We hate speaking about them. They're complex, they're personal. We just don't like doing it. So we shy away and we don't voice our concerns. And number two is that actually, as employers, you guys are not expected to be the experts or the gurus in all things finances. But actually, you do have a duty of care to make sure that you've got support in place or you can at least signpost your employees to places and experts of where they can go to get that support that they need. So that's really kind of why financial health in the workplace is really, really important from that people perspective, from that general well-being perspective. On the flip side of that, and Garin touched on it in his kind of opening gambit, was this piece around productivity. And that leads me to the 27% in that pink box. So actually 27% of people admit that money worries impact their performance at work. And this is a real issue because if you think about the organizations you work for, that's nearly a third of every organization in the UK where their employees aren't working to their best ability. They're not being their most productive. They're thinking about their finances throughout the work day. Maybe they're using time at work to speak to their banks or lenders or create those financial plans. So actually you as an, as a, as an employer, if you can put in those practical steps and that toolkit to help your employees with their finances to create that sense of confidence, actually that should translate into a real positive outcome for your bottom line as a business and the productivity of your employees. So we can see that there's lots of different benefits, not just to individuals, but to you as an employer and your businesses as well. So in terms of my top practical tips, and and there's lots to get through, so I'll go quite quickly. Uh, We use the acronym ROCKET uh, at Schroeder's Personal Wealth, and I'll come on kind of at the end as to why we use that. But the first top tip tip from my perspective is the R, so it's review in line with your wider wellbeing strategy. So I touched on that earlier. Finances actually underpin everything and they're so intrinsically linked to mental health so when you're looking at your well-being strategy in general just make sure that your financial well-being strategy sits alongside that and really interlinks with that because actually these things can't be looked at in isolation and they're not just standalone you know we've seen employers make real strides particularly over the last five years with regards to implementing really great mental and physical well-being strategies so we need to start to normalize the conversation of finances and bring it to the forefront and give it the same amount of limelight we've got some really great and we see this all the time with employees that we work with you've got these really great employee benefits sat over here such as the workplace pension scheme and then some of you even through that poll have said actually you've got some really great standalone financial well-being strategies over here but actually the two aren't talking to each other and that financial well-being strategy isn't then talking to your wider well-being strategy so it's really key that as a business we look at that in the round because all of these things are really really interlinked The O then stands for one-stop shop. Um, And we see this again come up time and time and again. And it it can be a physical one-stop shop, but really what I mean about that is just making it 
super, super easy for whatever you put in place to support your employees, making sure that it's easy for them to access that support that's available. We're creatures of habit and we love convenience. We know for a fact that if we're looking for an answer, we've got a question, we're looking for the answer to that. If we can't find it within the first 30 to 60 seconds, we stop looking. So as an employer, if you're putting together and spending money and and taking time and resource and effort to create this strategy, make sure that it's easy for your employees to access. Um, As I said, it's interlinked to all other things. So actually, do you have an employee engagement hub? Can your strategy and and support for employees sit alongside other things such as, you know, recognition and reward programs, employee benefits, employee communications, and just making sure that it's all really seamless and it's a really, really seamless journey for those employees to go on if they do have any questions, queries, or want that wider support. The C then is for communication. So actually, once you've got your fantastic financial wellbeing strategy and it links to all the elements and it's great, you've got to look at how you communicate that out. And when we go back and think about back when I was at school and you learn about different learning styles, about how people interact and learn in different ways. And we've got kind of the three key ones being visual, auditory and kinesthetic. And actually it's making sure that when you're communicating with your employees is that you have a range of communication styles because we what we don't want is for you to spend all of this time building this strategy, but then you know two thirds of your organization or your employees aren't engaging with it because actually you've just focused on, on one type of learning style. So it's making sure that we've got a way of communicating this out that's gonna you know, interact and engage with everybody. Once you've got those learning styles covered, then it's looking at that bigger picture of like the demographics of your organization. So actually, you know that you'll have, um, you know, what's the age range of people working in the business? You know, do you have a lot of millennials or do you have a lot of, you know, maybe over 55s? What does that split look like? Similarly with gender, actually, you know, what's the split between male and female? And all of these things are really important. And as an organization, that's something that we would look to understand when building a financial wellbeing strategy, because we know that say, men and women, for example, they... Um, engage with their finances in different ways they have different priorities they have different concerns so actually when you're you're looking at putting support in place we need to be able to cater for those different demographics different learning styles and different backgrounds and then finally to wrap all of that up it's looking at those regular communications because actually this isn't a tick box exercise we can't just put a strategy in place do a big launch com and off people go. Actually, this is something that will evolve over time. People will want to engage with it over time. So actually, how as an organization can you almost build that engagement plan to look at the different times of year? So we know that today's Blue Monday, great time for us to do a session like this. People are thinking about their finances. People are worried about their finances. What are the times throughout the year would actually then make sense for you as an organization to try and engage with your employees. So one of the big ones that comes up every year is obviously the tax year run year end so if we're thinking about when would be a good time to engage and communicate with our employees maybe around that April date it's a it's a great time to say do you know what it's tax year end these are some key considerations these are things you might want to think about and more importantly here's where you can go to get that support. Kate then is know the value of advice. So we're a little bit biased. I work for a financial planning company, but I genuinely hand on heart believe that financial advice can can provide so much value to individuals. And you'll see there on the slide, I've got a nice little timeline and some some key life events that come up kind of in everybody's life. Um, And what tends to happen when we speak to individuals is that they go through some of these life events, whether it's quite nice, positive life events, such as getting married, starting a family, buying a bigger house, or some of the more kind of negative um, events, such as maybe a relationship breakdown or a loved one passing away. And what we find is that people wait until they get to these key life events that are already quite stressful. And then they say, actually, I need a financial plan. I need to sort my finances out. I need to talk to someone. Where we want to get to is actually so everybody has a financial plan as a baseline 
And then when they go through one of these life events, they can pick up their financial plan, they can change it, they can adapt it, they can make it fit the life event that they're going through at that time. And what that means is that that their finances and that element of finances doesn't become an added stress on top of something that is already quite stressful as we go through life. So one thing that I always talk to employers about is that it's really great to have the signposting and the support available to employees. But actually, there will be times in life where people do genuinely need to speak to a financial advisor. And actually, do you are you partnered with a company um, to make that advice and make those experts and those professionals accessible to your employees when they do want that more bespoke one-on-one conversation about something that's going on in their life. The E then comes to engagement. So I've talked a bit about the Big Bang launch. I've talked a bit about how to come and, and position it with employees, which is great. But then how do you get people to physically engage with it? And there's lots of different things. And um, so we kind of categorize it at Trojan's Personal Wealth kind of into those four layers of, of interaction and engagement. So the first is financial education. That's just having in those broad articles, blogs, vlogs, podcasts, tools, calculators, making all of that really rich content available to your employees so that 24-7 they can go and access it, they can do it remotely. It's almost like that self-serve learning. If someone's got a question, they know where they can go to get the answer. The next level down then is around financial guidance. So actually that's maybe then thinking about, well, what can we do on top of the signposting and the education? Which providers are there out there in the market that we can bring into our organization to really enrich the support that we're providing? You know, is there providers out there that can come and deliver financial um, you know, webinars, seminars, smaller group sessions with our employees to really think about what are the key themes, what are the key topics or subjects that would really, you know, our employees are going to have questions about whether it's pensions or investments or protection or you know, retirement planning, whatever we think that looks and feels like, again, back to the demographics of your organization, where are their pain points, where are their pinch points? Let's build kind of a financial guidance plan around that to really engage and start to normalize the conversation of finances in the workplace. And then you get to that level of financial advice. So actually, once we've provided all the educational support, we've provided that guidance, we've brought providers into our workspace, then, as I said before, it's then about making advice accessible to employees. So if they do have that more personal topic that they want to talk to someone about, actually, is it right for them to come to talk to you as an employer? Or actually, is it right for, for you to signpost them to actually a credible professional that can genuinely support them with their finances? And then the final thing is about having that regular review. So if you're working with a provider, make sure that they're you're regularly reviewing the service that they're providing you, making sure that it's adding value to your employees. Or if you've done something in-house and built that strategy yourself, make sure that you've got those checkpoints throughout the year as well to make sure that, you know, it, again, it's not a tick box exercise. And if you've, you're spending money, time, resource on this initiative, make sure that it's genuinely adding value to your employees and the business. And then the final one is tailor-made well-being. So actually, you know, financial well-being such as mental health and everything else is really, really individual. And actually, there isn't just one financial well-being strategy that will suit every organization. And we've seen from the polls that actually there's people on this call where their businesses have less than 50 employees and some that have more than 5,000. So actually it's creating that strategy that's the right fit for you. And you'll see the words company culture in really big on, on my screen now because actually you need to create a strategy that's right for your employees. And I keep coming back to this over and over again. And um, there was a really interesting statistic that I saw um, from Glassdoor recently, which said 86% of millennials would actually take a pay cut to work for a company whose mission aligns with their own. And I think that's really, really key because actually when we look at what we're putting in place for our employees, remuneration is no longer the top priority, particularly for those younger generations. They want to work for a company whose mission aligns with them, where the culture feels right, where they've got those wellbeing strategies in place that are genuinely going to help them to develop and to engage more. So really thinking about actually how we can bring this to life 
and really develop a strategy that sits with our culture um, and is going to support our people. Because let's face it, your people are your biggest expense of the business. So if we can invest in things like these well-being strategies, actually, that means that you can retain and attract those, those, those right people for your business and have that positive effect. Um, I said I was going to touch on kind of our acronym. Um, so there you can see it's Rocket and, and this really really hits home for us so this is what we use with insure just personal wealth and actually one of the things that we say is money is just fuel for the rocket so actually yes it is about money it's about normalizing the conversation it's about speaking about your finances but actually that's not the end goal the end goal is where you want to get to it's where where do you want to go in your rocket it's about you know, what are your hopes, your dreams, your goals, your aspirations, and then sitting down and saying, right, well, how can I build a financial plan that is genuinely going to get me there? Um, so that was all I was going to cover today. Um, as I said, my name's Lee Dunkley. I'm the Financial Wellbeing Lead for Schroeder's Personal Wealth, and my details are, are on the screen, you know, if you do want to reach out afterwards and, and ask any questions. But I'll stop sharing my screen, and um, I think we've got a couple of questions that have come through. Thank you so much. Really appreciate um, that presentation, Lee, and really informative and taking people through the stages. I particularly like the, um, the bit where it kind of goes through a process of education and guidance and advice. Um, we've, we've had some really good questions through in the chat box. So I'm just going to start off with one that probably everyone's thinking uh, that's just come through um, is how can organisations start with small or no budget? <laughs> Yeah, and this is a, it, it's a great question. And it, it's one that comes up all the time when we're speaking to employers, because actually when you're, and, and a lot of you haven't, you know, haven't got a strategy in place at the moment. So it's where do we even begin? Um, and the first thing that I would say is there are a lot of, there are a lot of free resources out there currently. So have a look at the market and start to have those conversations. And actually, you've got some really great communities within the HR space, such as CIPD. So talk to other businesses that are in your situation and understand what are they doing um, and which providers are they working for um, and working with. And um, so, you know, I can confidently say that at Schroeder's Personal Wealth, you know, we deliver a lot of our financial education and guidance completely free of charge to employers and employees. So there are organizations out there that absolutely have those free resources, which is great. I talked a bit about um, employee benefits and you'll all, all of you will have some fantastic employee benefits as part of your organization. Challenge those providers is my absolute you know, go-to. So if you've got a workplace pension scheme in place, who is the provider? Are they actually giving you any extra added value benefits on top of providing the pension scheme? You know, can they come in and deliver some sessions? Do they have any materials that you could house on an intranet page or signpost them your employees to? And really challenge them because as your benefits providers, you're already paying them to provide a service to your employees in the business. So actually just ask because more times than, than not, they will have that support available and um, you just need to ask for them to provide it to you. Um, and then the final thing is, is use the data and the research. So some really, really compelling stats out there. And actually, if you can start to build up that picture and build up that business case for why you need a financial wellbeing strategy, that'll go a long way to then start to secure, you know, maybe a small budget at first, but hopefully by proving ROI and the data, you can then start to build on that and, and ask for more money. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and just as a note to everyone, um, I know some people are asking about what does Rocket stand for? Um, Lee and both Lee will be sharing their slides and you'll receive them from Monica um, from CIPD. So um, just onto a question, we've, we've got loads of questions coming in. So we may say some of the questions to the end when we've got Luke and Lee together, but a question from, from Deborah Soper. So how long would you say it would take to start from scratch to have a financial well-being strategy in place? I know it's a difficult question, but like, you know, obviously we're in a results business in HR. Um, you know, what is the sort of expectancy? absolutely no it, and, it, and do you know what it is i think one of the key things is that when you build a financial well-being strategy it doesn't have to be the perfect solution from day one actually let's just get a couple of people around the table from across the business and say actually what what do we want our minimum viable product to look like what support do we want to put in place and actually using the free resources and reaching out to providers you can start to build up what that could look like really really quickly and um, so example if you wanted to bring someone in to deliver some you know financial well-being sessions actually you could get those in the diary quite quickly and if you're quite a nimble organization and um, you know where you can 
you know, you, you've got the power to say, actually, I want to bring this provider in and do these sessions. I want to do it in this time. We can comment out to our employees in this way. Actually, the first step is just to start doing stuff and then get the feedback from employees. Is this working? Is this adding value? Um, as I said, some of the, you know, the measurables are really, really key and there'll be some really immediate, tangible measurables that you'll be able to see. So if you're putting on a webinar for your employees, you know what percentage of the organization was invited and actually turned up, how many people are engaging with the content that you're providing. But equally, um, I always suggest, you know, trying to get that measure or that baseline. So actually, do you do engagement surveys across your organization? Do one before you start to implement, you know, a, a strategy like this, then implement some some small things and then do it again as another touch point. You know, has the happiness or the engagement levels of your employees gone up? And actually, how can we measure that quite quickly and quite fast? Brilliant. Thank you. And we've got a whole stack of other questions to go through, but um, we're going to go over to Luke now for his section. Um, Lee, we're inviting you to actually get stuck into the chat box and you're very welcome to start answering people's questions. Um, so, uh, Luke, if we can just ask you, I'm just going to remove the spotlight from Lee. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you. And, and first of all, again, thanks for having me today. It's great to be able to talk to you a little bit around financial well-being and the strategy that we've introduced at Redico and hopefully you can kind of come away from this with a little bit of an idea about how we went about things, maybe a few tips and a bit of inspiration as well behind that. Before I get going into the financial side of things, a bit of an introduction into Redico because I'm sure you won't know who we are as a company. So we do a digital marketing predominantly focused on SEO, so that's search engine optimization. Last year we were named as the best small SEO agency in Europe, which was a really great achievement. And from a cultural perspective, I suppose, we are very different in terms of how the business is run day to day. And this is all down to like a people for per, uh, sorry, a people first approach, which a financial well-being strategy really does define and does help. And our kind of structure and our culture is built around trust. And so not to scale, but to, as a bit of a, an insight into what that culture looks like, it's all around self-regulation. If you ever heard of Teal as a principle, we work towards Teal, so people have as much holiday they want to. They set their own targets. People choose when and where and how they work. We remove managers, people choose our own coach. And this kind of focus that we took starting from 2018 has led to us being named as the fourth best place to work in the UK. So obviously I can't go too much in detail about that because it's a financial education day. Um, but if you do want to find out more, you are interested in kind of new ways of working in progressive ways and, and different ways of kind of approaching things and changing that mindset. There's some really good books to, to kind of look at as inspiration. So if you feel free to take a screenshot or a photo or something like that, just to take those down um, and they help to really kind of get that mindset in terms of progressive working and different ways that you can approach policies and practices in your organization. And there's a really good website as well, which you can find called the Corporate Rebels. So if you've not heard of those, um, it's kind of a collection of stories and authors and thought leaders and businesses all doing different radical things, all with a people first approach. And so this approach that we took we started around 2018. And since then, we've continued to evolve as a company. And by doing this, we had to continue to ask questions and get the team involved in every step of the journey. And that's where the financial education and financial well-being side of what we do now really came from. So this all stemmed from a anonymous survey. So when we entered the Great Place to Work, there's a survey that goes out to the team. And the team are asked to score um, us as a company on every single area of the business, from strategy to leadership to financial well-being and health and, and mental health and things like that. And the lowest score that we got as a company was on financial well-being. And that's because we'd never focused on it before. We just, it was something, it was like a blind spot. We hadn't really considered it. Um, it's one of those things where, uh, personally, I have my own financial thoughts and I think about how much I get paid and the bills I've got to pay. And I, I didn't really consider that. Obviously, everyone goes through exactly the same thing. So as a business, it would never really entered our, our minds to actually kind of implement this kind of strategy. But this is what the team wanted. And so in this kind of section here, I'm just going to kind of go through the journey we took to getting this place in place, a strategy, the importance of having a really good relationship as well, some lessons learned, which maybe you can take as inspiration as well, and also the importance of joining other communities and, and getting more inspiration and ideas from, from the wider community as well when it comes to the whole of well-being. Um, so the first step then in terms of the journey. So I think what's really important when, when you're coming from, from a company and trying to understand is actually the issue and trying to understand what the problem is that you're trying to address. Because when you think about it, and I, I kind of thought about what the key problem is, and it's that we leave school without really having a good financial understanding. I think back to when I was 18, for instance, coming out of school, I didn't know 
how to get a mortgage or how much money I would need for a mortgage or, or what the deposit might look like. Things about pensions I wasn't really interested in, 18, coming out of school. So, we, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I came out of school, went to university, got a Capital One card, ended up getting student loans and running up debts and overdrafts and things like that. And that's what happens to a lot of people now coming out of education. So there's a huge gap there where businesses are now kind of needing to fill this gap around financial education and helping their team to know more about what's going on. Whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, they're going to be really big financial milestones that you need to tick off and really help your team with. So when you know the problem, you then need to find out what do the team actually want to get from it. So, and the only way you're going to find out is actually going out and speaking to the team. So what do they want to get from my financial well-being sort of strategy and initiative? What do they want to see from that? So we ran a survey of our team to find out what they wanted. And as you can see there, the biggest one that came back was around mortgages. So, I mean, our team predominantly, uh, a big portion is, is late 20s, early, 40, early 30s. So they're the people that are going to be going out, getting mortgages for the first time, maybe buying a second house. The budgeting side of it is going to come into that as well, sort of saving for deposits and being able to manage money in a, in a better way. Pensions and investments are things that people want to learn more about. A lot of the time people think investments are just for rich people, but actually that's not the case at all. And it's something that anyone should have the knowledge and, and education to be able to make informed decisions on. So this kind of helped to lead the way in terms of where we needed to get to from a financial side, which paved the way to then start interviewing potential candidates of who we could bring in to the organisation to help deliver this strategy. Because only when you know what the team want can you start to think about who you're going to bring in to help to roll this out. And I use the word interview because I want you to think about this as bringing someone in, like a new hire into your team. Now, you would interview people if you had a job application, a job opening. You'd hire multiple people, maybe have multiple interviews with the same person. You want to make sure they're engaging, they're likable, they're going to do what they say they're going to do. They're going to bring value ultimately to your team and what they're doing. So you really have to bring value. This, the whole thing is around bringing value. It's not a box ticking exercise. It's about bringing real value into the team and making sure that the strategy is going to be good from the go. And once you've worked out who that person's going to be, it's then time to start creating that structure. And I mentioned there around continually evolving. And that's really key as well, because you can start implementing things, implementing ideas. But you've got to continue to tweak that and change things and adjust things as you go, because you're going to get feedback from the team. And again, speaking to the team all the time and getting that feedback on what's working well, what are you enjoying about this initiative, what could be better? So when we started doing this, we had sort of recorded sessions that people could watch in their own time. But actually, it became evident that people might want to have sort of live sessions of Q&A so they can ask things in real time and get inspiration from other people in the team. Maybe some ideas they hadn't really thought about. OK, cool. So we'll start doing a live session. And then people might say, well, actually, um, I don't want to ask my questions. It might be a personal financial question I don't want to ask in a group setting. So actually, I'd rather have a, a one to one afterwards, maybe a, a live session and a one to one afterwards. So you can continually tweak and, and refine how you actually approach this by speaking to the team and working out what they want. And really, you want to bring in someone to your team to help do this that's happy to tweak things and change things and work with your company and with your team to essentially deliver the best possible service which all comes down towards the importance of building that relationship because it's not a one-off thing. And what I mean by that is if your team want to know more about mortgages as, as one of the top things, I would recommend not going out and just bringing in a mortgage broker to give a 10-minute um, presentation and then skimming everyone for commission and then disappearing. That's it, box ticks, financial education done. But I don't think that's the solution. The solution is finding someone or a company to come in who can do absolutely everything and start building a really good relationship. And an example I'll use is that from a mental health side, we use a company called Sanctus. Now, every single month, everyone in the team knows that on a dedicated day, they can speak to their mental health coach, the same person, they know exactly who it's going to be. Treat your financial well-being in exactly the same way. Have the same person, the same team they know they can speak to, any questions, any problems, they can build up that relationship, build up the rapport, and you know that they're going to act on what they're doing. And that's it. it's a professional, good service that's bringing value. And once you've got that in place, you can start to have these really good interactive sessions on the key financial milestones that people may have and the questions they're going to ask, such as mortgages, moving home, getting on the property ladder, saving and designing your future lifestyle. How much money do you need for when you retire? Financial protection and insurances for you and your family. Things around money management, which came up earlier, is a big one for our team. Investments and ISAs and sustainable investing, all really good topics. And again, all really good topics that we just don't know very much about. 
we tend to just kind of search Google if we need to find out something and get a lot of conflicting advice and information when actually having a real dedicated personal company helping to deliver this is such a much better option than, than just Google. So once you've got that in place, you start to deliver these interactive sessions, you can then begin to have one-to-one -one guidance and support as well afterwards. You can only do that by having this solid financial partnership that's an ongoing thing in your company. There'll also be the option of more support. So the chances are there's blogs and articles that people can be signposted to. And there's also the chance of affiliations with different charities. Now, a good example here is Step Change as a financial debt management charity. Now, I'd never heard of them. I didn't know there were charities available for financial debt and things like that. So if I don't know about it, the chances are 40, 50, 60, 70% of the team in the UK don't, aren't aware of this. So if someone's got a problem that they're struggling with and they don't want to talk to me or they don't want to talk to the managing director or their manager, whoever it might be, they've got their signposted to these really good support services they can go out and speak to. And we wouldn't know that if we hadn't started implementing this strategy. And as a final tip as well, just make sure that if, when you do proceed with this and you do kind of go further, make sure they're financial conduct authority regulated and they can give advice because it's obviously um, a massive thing to make sure they are. In terms of the financial wellbeing strategy then, so around two thirds of our team have engaged with that, which actually is a really big number because there's always going to be some people that don't want to talk about finances. They don't want to get involved in things like this. Maybe they feel that their finances are actually in a good place. So if that's two thirds of our team, two thirds of your team, two thirds of the UK that want to have this kind of education, it shows there is a massive gap and a massive uh, hole to fill, fill with this education. So it's something really that you should be focusing on. So then a few lessons learned then from us as a company since implementing this strategy. First of all, the obvious one I think would be start now. Back to 2015, 2016, I wish we had started then because I was blind to this problem. I wasn't aware that it really was such a big thing that there were services out there to help support this. So don't start this next month or next year or put it on the back burner. Start now, go out and start speaking to your team. Find out what they want, what they want to get from this financial wellbeing program and just start that ball rolling. You might not get it right the first time. You don't have to be perfect. And of course, that's absolutely okay. In our society, we have this thing where we have to try and get perfection all the time. But by doing that, you're only gonna be disappointed. So don't try and be perfect. Make sure that you start doing something and improve it. Have a culture of continuous improvement where you're getting good feedback from the team. What's working well? Is it providing value? Is this something that's working? Is this something that actually the team feel is really beneficial to their day to day? So you might not get it right first time. Make sure that you're speaking to that provider, you're tweaking things, you're changing things, you're adjusting things, and it's okay not to be perfect. And then finally, on a very similar note and related to that, you can't please everyone. So don't have this approach where you feel like you have to please absolutely everyone in your organization. There's always going to be someone that doesn't agree or it doesn't quite work for them. So go with the mindset that you're trying to bring value and just remember that you can't please everyone. And then finally, just an important section around joining a community, because what's really important is you don't need to have all of the answers to this. You don't need to have the solutions around financial education or general wider well-being. And there are communities out there that can really help you and support you on that, whether it's financial education, whether it's mental health education, whether it's physical well-being, whatever it might be, get yourselves involved in these communities. And there's one on LinkedIn, which is a really good one, which is hashtag let's improve workplace well-being. So if you're interested to join that, there's lots of information on that. Loads of different people from different walks of life just sharing information. So it's a really good place to start if you're interested. Uh, and unfortunately, I think my time is almost up now. So if you do want to find out any more, um, feel free to reach out whether you want to find out more about the, the financial well-being strategy we implemented, dig a little bit deeper into that, any questions I don't answer today, even if you want to find out about some of the, the wacky, radical ways in which we work and policies, initiatives and, and things like that, please feel free to reach out. Again, my contact details are here, so LinkedIn, Twitter, email, whatever it is, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to share whatever you want um, for, from this or anything else as well. So thanks a lot for your time. Um, I'm sure there's some questions, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. thank you thank you so much Lou. that's really really informative and, and and thanks for sharing the actual journey kind of sort of step by step there's it's one thing understanding the steps but it's another thing to actually share your experiences along the way um again we've had loads of questions coming in um so um one, one of the questions that came up was um what questions did you actually ask in the survey can you can you remember some of those questions just to get to the bottom of and understand the, the actual situation of the organization and the employees yes yeah, so, i mean the, the key one to start with is kind of 
do, do you want to have a final like, do you want to have more of financial education and well-being because actually some people might not want to so the first one is finding out how many people want to find out more how many people want to get involved in this type of scheme then what is it that you want to focus on so obviously depending on the demographic of your company it could be very different in terms of the results you get for us it was mortgages and, and debt management or money management and things like that for, for different companies it could be around pensions and investments depending on the demographic so finding out exactly what you want to get from from that program is, is a really key one as well um i'm trying to re cast my mind back to to the uh, initial survey um but they i think they're the real key ones because from that you can then work out who's going to be the right company for you um, going forwards. Um, and when you start having those interviews, start working out who you're going to bring on to help your team and bring the value, you can look back to those. Uh, to be honest, what I'll probably do is share that survey if I can. I'll find those results and share it to everyone at a later date. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And, and Lee's been working very hard in the chat box, but um, I just want to answer, uh, ask some of the questions that she's been answering as well. Um, obviously, you know, of all the taboos in the workplace, people would be much more uh, ready to answer, talk about other things than finances. Um, what was your, how did you get people to actually open up and start talking about what is one of the last workplace taboos? Yeah. So I suppose luckily we've, we've created this culture where everything is very transparent and very open anyway um so i think for us it was a lot easier we have sort of schemes in place where we help to kind of educate people in the company on the wider business issues as well such as teaching them what a PL looks like and a balance sheet and and giving them a will rider kind of business insight into how the actual money works at the company and so those types of conversations automatically begin people on the path of actually looking at themselves and and, and approaching those and, and talking about that um, so for us, it was it was quite an easy thing. I think it's you don't have to have kind of open sessions where everyone discusses their own finances. I think you can provide a balance between having group discussions and, and group sessions. We having that one to one personal anonymous support where you can reach out and speak to someone. Um, and I think as long as you find that balance, that's that's the key part there. Right, thank you, and and obviously, just um, I want to say a quick thank you just to to Ryan Briggs, who's, who was the person that worked with you on this, just because obviously he um, I talked to him the day after Boxing Day, uh, and he put me in contact with you because obviously he said you were a very good case study um, of someone who's actually successfully implemented a strategy, and just the same question that we asked to Lee as well. Now, how long has this process taken you, and and how long do you see it continuing onwards for? Yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned the thing that I just see it as a continually evolving strategy now so we started rolling this out pretty much just after the pandemic hit last march so probably the worst time possible to to be even looking at this um but also the best time possible because that's when people are really going to be worried about their finances and we kind of timed it in a very similar approach so i and rmd kind of said to people look this is going to be a really tough time at the moment for people's finances if you are struggling and you do want extra support, like speak to us because we can support you as a business. Like there's a mortgage broker, we'll help you fix you up with, we'll pay the costs if you need that as well. Obviously banks are off in sort of mortgage breaks and things like that. So combining that with the personal touch is really good. But for us, last March it started, I think we started the first sessions around the summer of last year. And since then we've just continually sort of added to that and changed that going forward. And there's sort of new sessions coming up as well for people. Um, so it's just, it's just working constantly with the provider to to bring as much value as possible. And it, I think it's going to be something that's always, always evolving and always changing. Brilliant. Thank you. And we've got, we've got a question from, from, uh, uh, from Jan or Jan, sorry. Um, Luke, have you ever run into an issue around risk on education versus providing financial services? Um, is that kind of sort of striking that balance? I ask only because there's been a real concern at my own company, RE Risk, that we might be promoting certain products and services. Um, hi, does it help if I add a bit of context? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Ann. Uh, hello. Hi, Luke. Thank hi. you for all of that. That was really interesting. Um, but y yes, so um, we, we're we a housing provider. Um, so we, we provide um, social housing as well as commercial um, properties for sale. And so there is still a degree of, um, I would say, local authority type influence and thinking. Um, and when we've had this debate and, and and we do have a financial well-being strategy, but it's something that we come back to time and time again, is that we must walk very carefully the line between pointing people towards a advisory and support services um, and providing education and awareness. But we absolutely can't 
be seen uh, to even be flirting with uh, the risk that we might be somehow promoting or um, pointing people towards certain products and services. I was going to say, Lee, you're very welcome to come in on this one as well. Sorry. Definitely. It's something that that comes up time and time again. And and as I said, kind of in my opening pieces, you know, as employers, you are not meant to be the experts, particularly when it comes to finances. And you're right, there is such a fine line between signposting and giving advice and recommending products, which you absolutely should not be doing. Um, A couple of things from from my perspective, and, and particularly around if you're going to bring kind of financial advisory firm into the mix, is definitely do your due diligence and and absolutely ask the right questions of them. So actually, you know, how are their advisors remunerated? You know, are are they self-employed? Do they earn commissions? Are they targeted on what they're doing? Because actually you want to work with an organisation where that's not even an issue from day one. You want to work with an organisation that is genuinely going to deliver the best support for your your employees and they're not going to come in and, and kind of sell. And you also want to look at the the kind of financials of that business. You know, are they well established? Have they been in the market for years? Do they do they come with high recommendations? Are they backed by other organisations that have that credibility and that expertise? All of that should play into your decision making. And also, don't just go with the first provider that approaches you or you have a conversation with. You know, stack them up side by side. Make sure that you as an organisation can say, actually, we've done a formal process, we've got some governance around this, and we genuinely understand the businesses we're working with, and we can categorically say to the business and our employees that we've done that due diligence. And that those governance processes, those tender processes, is absolutely something that, you know, I've been through personally quite often and and can absolutely share some more insight into that. And the final piece for me would be if, if the business's kind of risk standpoint is very risk averse, Actually, you know, particularly for something like financial advice um, or, a, a, you know, a service or an offering or a product, don't just have one provider. Actually, why don't you create a small panel of providers that can support employees? And then those employees can do their own research, see which provider best fits their needs, their personalities, their goals. And then as an individual, is them making that choice as opposed to you as an employer recommending just one provider. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. A really good question. Thank you, Jan. Um, and I've got um, a question from Andy Lee. I think Andy asked a brilliant question in the last session as well. So, um, And this is a question because we have to provide a compelling case that this effort and investment actually makes a return for the organisation. We don't want it to be nice to have. And his question is, um, could you share what measures of success um, and what is the biggest impact final financial well-being has made? So, Luke, um, and then Lee will follow with you after that's OK. So, Luke. Yeah, I mean, so I'll be I'll be brutal. I'll be really honest here in that for us, it is kind of like bringing that support to the team. And first and foremost, it's that people first approach where we're trying to to make sure that people are happy in their own place and that they can bring them whole selves to work because there's not the issues going on in their background. So I suppose I'm not we don't necessarily tie it to some kind of reward afterwards in terms of how that impact is going to be. Um, for us, it's more that. I mean, since we've implemented this, there's three people in the team that have gone and got a mortgage. And like for us, it's like the value of seeing that is just incredible that actually we can have such a positive impact on people's lives by by delivering this and by having this in place. Um, so, so really, it's I we yeah we don't tie it to any ch- tangible results. It's kind of part of the wider well-being thing. Um, from us as a, as a business, in terms of sort of wider results. Um, our internal happiness scores have, have gone up to like world-class levels on the NPS. Our client um, scores have gone up to world-class on the NPS. Revenue and profit has gone up every single year since we we started this approach. Um, and, and think and like sickness has gone down. So that's one of the big ones as well. Is that we pay we pay for all sickness, but it's actually dropped to like 0.46 days per person a year, and the average is like 4.1 in the UK. So I think you've got to tie it more to the general well-being rather than just this initiative. Um, Because for us, it's just making that difference and making that impact. Yeah, I'd really agree on that. You know, you don't have to come up with some new way of recording like the return on investment and this. So, you know, look at how your, you know, what are your metrics at the moment in terms of of well-being and productivity? Do you do engagement surveys? Look at the impacts of that. You know, Luke touched on some really good ones there, which I will kind of reiterate. But other ones could be actually, you know, turnover of employees. Actually, are you attracting and retaining employees better than you did before? And um, we touched on NPS, happiness scores. 
tangible things, as I said earlier, you know, just attendance, interactivity, engagement with the stuff that you're putting on um, is really, really good. So you've got those real tangibles from kind of the scores and the metrics, but also look at the intangibles. Um, and there's just one example that I want to quickly share because it was the first time that I'd ever been into a business um, and it was pre-COVID, so we could deliver it face to face. But I've got no doubt, you know, we'd have the same impact in this remote virtual world. But we went in and we delivered some well-being sessions to over 100 employees and um it was actually after the session, you know, we talked about finances being a taboo and actually this lady approached me afterwards and she said, I'm really, really sorry. Can I just take five minutes of your time? I said, absolutely, you know, let's go find a quiet space. And what came about through just attending this seminar was that she tragically lost her husband the year before in a car crash. She had a young daughter that she wanted to pay to go through university. Um, you know, her finances were a mess. She didn't know where to turn. She didn't want to talk to an employer. She didn't want her employer to think badly of her for it, you know, to let them know that it was affecting her performance, but she just didn't even know where to turn. And for me, you can have all the metrics in the world, but those intangible stories about how you are genuinely putting in place support to help your employees is just you, you can't get better than that. So it, it, and, and, you know, when we talk about normalizing the conversation of finances, it's exactly the same as mental health. Create that safe space for people to share their stories because that will just resonate right through the organization. Yeah. Just, just to add, sorry, at the end, I think at the moment we're living in the most, probably most difficult time when it comes to financial sort of well-being from both businesses struggling and people really struggling and anything your business can offer that can support people later down the line will prove really valuable because it will mean that people do want to stay with your company and do see that you care and you support and you inspire people in the team. Great. Thank you so much. And we've just got, we've got two minutes left. Um, and I guess I just want to just ask you, put you on the spot a little bit. If there's one thing you would like people to take away from today's presentation, because everyone's going to go back to their desk tomorrow morning and think about where do I start? And two thirds of the the audience today um, don't have a financial wellbeing strategy. They're doing something or nothing. Where, where, where can they start? What would be the one thing for both of you? Uh, so I've got to let you go first. <laughs> no, I was going to say just don't wait just you know you've you've got myself and luke here and there's a number of other people on this call within the cip network cipd network do not wait you know go away tomorrow and reach out to the people that are on this call reach out to myself and luke have that conversation whether you work with us or not just start the conversation find out how others are doing it what you know what are the top tips take the top tips away and just start to implement something tomorrow as we said it doesn't have to be the perfect solution but just get something in place that's going to support your employees brilliant thank you luke yeah i mean I, I absolutely echo that and just to add really just just speak to your team as well find out exactly what they want to get from this start putting together surveys and getting feedback and, and working out what kind of value they would find from this and what are the areas of, of financial well-being that really resonate with them and and really matter to them and then make sure you actually act on that feedback because the worst thing you can do is create this culture of getting feedback but never ever showing any kind of progression in terms of what you're offering um, and it just builds like a culture of distrust so get that feedback and then act on it brilliant thank you so much guys i think obviously i hope you all agree that um luke and lee have been absolutely outstanding tonight in terms of answering questions and just being really practical in terms of the strategies they've shared tonight and also they've been very generous volunteering their time to help us this evening uh, but most of all we want to say a huge thank you to you as a profession yeah, you know giving up your your winter monday evenings at difficult times um just to better yourself and to support your organizations as well so we want to say a huge thank you on behalf of cipd central london um, and to north london um, and we really hope to see you at the, uh, the next event that's the end of our well-being series for 2020 2021 uh, but we really hope to see you at future events and keep you posted on other things that happen in the future so thank you so much Bye.